Ezekiel chapter 14. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Because we know that you give us your word to wake us up spiritually and draw us to yourself. Lord, your heart is after us. You're pursuing relationship with us. And so we come tonight just with open hearts and say, God, then show us. Move among us. Draw us to yourself. We pray that now in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you're with us uh, for a while, you know, of course, that Ezekiel is a prophet. He's living in Babylon with the people who've been exiled. Uh, he's warning them over and over. The Lord is warning them through this prophet in order to turn them around. They've been hard-hearted. They've been rebellious. And, you know, the word rebellious, you can picture, imagine all kinds of things to rebel spiritually is to rebel against God and to go into every manner of worldly things. And the result is disaster. I think anybody who's been around the world, experienced the world at all, have, you know, your worldly experience should tell you that disaster and death is the result of worldliness. And so therefore, God's trying to bless our lives. You know, when he calls us to revival, he's blessing us. He's trying to show us a path which is the path of life and, and favor and blessing and goodness. And, and this is really important because, you know, many people, they have a desire. They want to live a dream. You know, they want the dream of their life to be good, you know. And, and many people, they have these things in their mind, you know, what it means to have the blessing. You know, I want a good life. And I want relationships, and I want, I want things to be, you know, I got this dream. And I think that's good. That's great, a good desire. But here's something that we need to understand that we actually get from this scripture, from the lessons of Israel. And that, you know, these kinds of dreams, living that blessed life, they don't come from emptiness. That, it doesn't come from wrongfulness comes from faithfulness, comes from steadfast faithfulness. That's when God blesses. That's when the favor of God orders your steps and you, you find the blessing and favor of God that just fills the heart and the soul. Man, that's, that's the best place we could ever be. And that's what he's trying to show us. And this is important because we're all born with an empty place. We're all born with a soul that's empty. And the, and the problem is, the older you get, the more you are aware of it, and you try to fill it with everything out there in the world, and it has the reverse effect. Instead of uh, getting your, your, your soul satisfied, you feel like your soul is poisoned, and it's death, and you feel yucky, you know? If you've ever been into the worldly thing, you know that the result of it is spiritual yuckies. Your soul is just like, Ew you know, yuck. And so there is a great lesson for us. All right, that's the backdrop. So God is trying to get a hold of them spiritually because they've been rebellious, they've been hard-hearted. And so he doesn't want this repeated, okay? So he's gonna just be straightforward with them. Here's the thing you gotta love about the Lord. You know, you look at the Lord Jesus as an example. Oh, there were so many times when he was just the tenderest, you know, soft, Loving grace, you know, a woman caught in adultery, and here he brings his grace to her. And there were other times when people were just, you know, difficult and hard, and he'd just speak right into their lives that strong word they need. Sometimes what we need is just a, a, a cold glass of water spiritually thrown in our face. You know what I'm saying? Like, wow, I needed that. We needed the, we needed the Lord to wake us up. Amen. Okay, so that's kind of what the Lord's doing, right? So chapter 14, 1, so then some of the elders of Israel came to me and they sat down before me. Okay, so why are they doing that? Well, because they're there inquiring of the Lord. So they know that Israel, uh, Ezekiel's a prophet. And so they're coming, sitting before Ezekiel. We are inquiring of the Lord. What does the Lord say? Okay, so that's the picture. So the word of the Lord came to me. Saying, now, son of man, which is the phrase used to describe Ezekiel. By the way, interestingly, 
Jesus used that phrase in reference to himself many times. Son of man, he said. These men, now get what he's saying here. This is, a, this is cold water right in the face. Morning alert, cold water in the face. Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts. And they have put right before their faces the stumbling block of their iniquity. Should I be consulted by them at all? They've come to get a word of the Lord. They've come to hear, to inquire of the Lord. Here's the problem. Here's the deal. They have idols in their hearts. And he, he goes on, and therefore they put right before their faces the stumbling block of their iniquity. Why should I listen to these people at all? Now, you got to admit, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty straight up. That's pretty straightforward. And that's a great word for them to hear. And it's a great word for us to hear. You know, an idol in the heart. What does that mean? Well, it's the secret things. You know, we kind of described this before when uh, Israel was told to dig a hole in the wall. It was a spiritual vision to dig a hole in the wall and to look through. And he could see into the inner chambers of their heart which was a pretty ominous thought. Can you imagine, you know, if somebody dug uh, through the wall, you might say, of your spirit and looked inside and they saw what is carved on the walls of your heart, uh, you know, that's a wake-up moment right there, you know. To put light of what is actually in the darkness is a rather splash cold water in your face moment. And this is one of those things. They've got idols in their hearts. I can see through their hearts. I know right what's going on in their hearts. And so this is good for us because we have to consider that the heart is where revival happens. Revival happens right in the core of who we are, the reality of the inner man. That's what God is looking for. Not the outward appearance of the thing. Don't put white paint over that mess. Go for the inner reality of the soul. That's where revival happens. That's where authentic, genuine relationship to God happens. I don't know about you. I want the genuine, authentic, real work of God in my soul. Anybody else? Let's see, but we have to then honestly deal with it. Are there idols? Well, are there idols today? Are there such things as idols today? Sure. There's all manner of things that could be idols. I mean, I don't need to list them. I think your imagination right now is probably putting your finger right on it. Isn't that true? You know, it's, and it could be anything. It could be any many manner of things. Now, of course, one of the issues with idols is often sexuality. And we mentioned this on Sunday. Sexuality touches the soul which is why sexuality is such a very important topic because it messes up the soul when it's wrongful. And so, you know, again, we want the dreams of God's blessing. Well, blessing like that comes from faithfulness and faithfulness when the category of faithfulness is sexuality. And so there's all manner of sexual opportunities uh, through the eyes, etc., that poison the soul. And God wants us to have sincere, genuine, authentic revival. It happens in the soul. He's just being straight up honest about it. You know, but it could be anything. It could be a number of things. I was hearing uh, this guy was into chess. And he said, I had to quit chess. It became an idol. It became an addiction. Um, you know, it's hard for me to imagine chess as an addiction. But, you know, I think chess is awesome. But he said... Hey, when you, when you check into a hotel and, you, and you're up half the night playing speed chess and you realize you're not getting any sleep and you're just going after one game after the other of speed chess, you realize at some point you're like an alcoholic drinking aqua velva. You know, you get that analogy? In other words, you're like, you're desperate. You know, and he said, for me, I had to just quit the whole chess thing because it was becoming an addiction. It was becoming an idol in my life. Well, that's one example, but there's many others. You know, some people could be golf. Okay, pastor, you get way too personal here. Uh, you know, it, it could be video games. It could be video games. 
I don't know. Does, you know, do I need to, doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit is touching right now. The Holy Spirit is speaking to that. And why is, why is he doing that? Why does he take cold water with ice in it and throw it in our face? Because he's saying, wake up spiritually. Because here's what I want. I want your heart. Let's not fake it. That's real. Let's have a real revival. I don't want a fake revival. I want a real revival. Anybody else? And it's when the church falls in love. Love is a great word. True love, authentic love, is true. It means it's sincere. It's not fake. That's what, you know that phrase, true love? Uh, they make too much of it in the sense of, oh, true love, you know. And, and What does it mean, true love? It means love, that it's true. It's not faked. It's true and that's what he's saying. I want you to love that's true. So he goes on. That's just two verses. Let's go on. Verse 4. Therefore, speak to them and say this. Say, thus says the Lord. Okay, there's, they're, they're there before Ezekiel. They hear a word, and this is what the word is. Any man of the house of Israel who sets up idols in his heart and puts right before his face the stumbling block of his iniquity, and then comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will be brought to give him an answer in this matter in view of the multitude of his idols. In other words, this isn't good. I'm going to take into consideration the multitude of idols, and I'm going to give you an answer with that in the view. Oh, Lord, this is when we need grace. And here's one full thing about living under the new covenant, we have the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ covers all our sins. I don't know about you, but I thank God for that in a huge way. Anybody else got a truckload of sin that they need to say, thank you, God, because your grace, your forgiveness is amazing? And that's really helpful for us to understand. But he says to them, Notice, this is interesting, verse 5, I'm doing this, I'm saying this in order to lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel. There's God's heart right there. I want to lay hold of your heart. Now, that's an interesting phrase, to lay hold of your heart, to lay hold of. You get this picture, I mean, let's just do our best to picture it. The, you know, the heart, the center of our affection, the center of our spiritual being. God says, I want to reach in with my hand and I want to take hold of your heart and I want to, I want to bring it to myself in love. There's that, you, you can just imagine that loving, touching, massaging hand. He said, That's, I want to put my hand right in the center and core of who you are. I want to draw you to myself. I want to put your heart right next to my heart. There's something beautiful about that. Something beautiful about that. And by the way, you know, there's so many analogies here to how we live our lives. I'm convinced it has a lot to do with even how we parent. I think as parents, I think that one of the things that we want to do is to lay hold of their heart, you might say. To really love our children into a place where they are rising into what God wants them to be. In order to do that, you've got to lay hold of their heart. They must have that soft relationship to you. Can you do that and still have rules and have, uh, you know, boundaries? Absolutely. Uh, a good father and good mother has boundaries, but they have love in it. Amen. He goes on to say, I'm doing this just to lay hold of your hearts the, of the house of Israel who are estranged from me because of their idols. See, this is the whole thing. Idols, those things in our lives, they cause us to be estranged, to be far from the Lord. This is why in Isaiah, God says, it's your iniquities that have caused a separation, uh, a chasm between us. And here's where the beauty of, of the cross is. Yeah, our sins have created this chasm, but the blood of Jesus 
forgives sin so that we have now an opportunity for a relationship we could never have had. When he forgives our sin, we can have an open and honest relationship and beautiful relationship because he covers our sin with his blood and brings us into that love relationship. Very beautiful. Verse six, therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, repent. I, you, can't, you can't get it any more straight up, straightforward than this, right? Here's, what I, here's the word of the Lord. Repent. Stop with the idols. Turn around. Repent, he says. And turn away from your idols and turn your faces away from all the abominations. Now, this is a good word for us. If you turn your heart away from those things, you need to also understand that we need to turn our hearts toward the Lord. Because if, if, you, if you, let's say, uh, let go of the passions involved in worldly things, and you don't replace that with the authentic passion of Christ, the authentic passion of the Lord, you will find that the, the, the soul is still quite empty. And therefore, you have not found the answer that your soul desires. You have not found the answer to the longing of your soul. If you turn away from those things, you need to turn towards the Lord. In other words, we have to have that relationship that God fills our soul. How do you do that? How do you do it? What's the, give me the, the, the real answer. How do I have that in my life? The answer is, of course, that you open your heart, ask him to fill with his Holy Spirit, and that you draw near to him in an authentic relationship. A relationship is where you talk, that's prayer, and where there's uh, emotional connection, I think that's worship, and that's wh where we receive to know him better, that's his word. And you, and you are therefore having the input of spiritual things. You're inputting spiritual things into your life. If you don't input spiritual things, you're still empty. And if you're still empty, you're still in trouble. The soul was made to be filled. The soul was made to be filled. And we're, therefore, we need to know that intimate secret of victory. The soul that is filled is the soul that is alive. And that's important. So he says, repent from it, turn away from it. Verse seven, for anyone of the house of Israel or of the immigrants who stay in Israel, who separates himself from me, sets up idols in his heart, puts right before his face the stemming block of his iniquity, and then comes to the, the prophet to inquire of me for himself, I, the Lord, will be brought to answer him in my own person, in one way or the other. I will answer in my own person. That can be really, really awesome. Yes, Lord, answer. Bring your person. Bring the Holy Spirit. Or he'll say, or I'm going to get right in the middle of that mess. And you know what? That can be good. That can be good. Yes, Lord, come right in the middle of this mess and, and, and redeem it, change it. But most people, of course, that are in the world and heart of heart don't want the Lord in the middle of their mess. But he says, I'm going to get myself right in the middle. I'm myself, my person, I'm going to get right in the middle of it. I don't know about you, but I love it. See, to me, that's, that's how I think we should parent. See, I think parents need to be engaged. And when my, when my kids, you know, messed up, all kids mess up because I was a kid and I messed up. Amen? I mean, I know how it goes. And so, uh, you know, I see my kids messing up. You know what I do with my kids that mess up? I'm going in, I'm diving in, I'm getting involved in this. Uh, I'm gonna be right in the middle of that mess with you and we're gonna work this out together. Because I love you and I'm your father and I'm not leaving and I'm not forsaken and you can count, I'm gonna be right in the middle of this mess. So he goes on. I'll answer with my own person, verse eight, and I'm gonna set my face, you know, when he says face, he's saying I'm involved. I'm right in the middle of it. It's my face. I'm going to set my face against that man who, you know, resists and is hard and rebellious. I'm going to make him a sign, a proverb, and cut him off for my people. And then you will know that I am the Lord. There's that phrase. 
Now, if the prophet, this is the false prophet, is prevailed upon to speak a word, it's I, the Lord, who have prevailed against that prophet. And I will stretch out my hand against him and destroy him among all my people. And they will bear the punishment of their iniquity as the iniquity of the inquirer, so the iniquity of the prophet will be in order that the house of Israel may no longer stay stray from me and no longer defile themselves with all their transgressions. They are in it together. They'll fall in it together. Thus, they will be my people and I will be their God, declares the Lord. In other words, I'm doing this for revival. I'm doing it for revival. Verse 12, then the word of the Lord came to me saying this, this is interesting. Son of man, if a country sins against me by committing unfaithfulness, and I stretch out my hand against it, destroy its supply of bread, set famine against it, and cut it off, or cut off from it both man and beast, even though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in their midst, by their own righteousness they could only deliver themselves, declares the Lord. This is interesting. He brings up these three guys. Noah going way back in their history, was a righteous man. As you know, the, the, the earth was destroyed by a flood, but Noah was righteous before the Lord. Daniel was actually living right there in Babylon, and he was a man of righteousness. You remember the story? He was one of the first group that were exiled out of Jerusalem. He was just a young man. What had happened was Nebuchadnezzar said, I want the choicest, finest young men to serve in my court. Find the most intellectual, capable, men of highest degree and character. Daniel was chosen along with, you know, his three friends, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And they were brought, and the, Daniel uh, was amongst them. You remember the story? They laid out before Daniel and the three all these choice meats and uh, things, you know, from the king's table. And he said, I can't eat this. Very likely unclean things. I cannot eat this. And he said, I'll tell you what, I will eat vegetables, grains, only the health, you know, healthiest things. The guy says, man, I can't do that. You're going to be sickly and then I'm going to be in trouble. And remember Daniel said, no, give me 10 days. And if I'm sickly, then fine. But if not, we'll prevail. Of course, you know the story. Daniel uh, ate the grains and the vegetables and, you know, dedicated himself to the Lord is what he was doing. And the blessing of God poured out, you know, the vigor of his life. And he rose above his contemporaries and was a man of stature and righteousness to the point that he was interpreter of dreams and stood before kings. Great, awesome man that we're going to get into his book next. Wow, in Daniel, you get prophecies like in no other book. It is just amazing. So Daniel is mentioned, and then Job. As we know, Job was a righteous man. And he says, if these three men were in their midst, they could only deliver themselves, declares the Lord. If I were to cause wild beasts to pass through the land, and they depopulated it, and it became desolate so that no one would pass through it because of the beast. Though these three men were in its midst, as I live, declares the Lord God, they could not deliver either their sons or their daughters. They alone would be delivered, but the country would be desolate. Interesting. They couldn't even deliver their own sons or daughters by their righteousness, which is to mean what? Every man, every woman stands on their own before the Lord. We have our own relationship. Husband, you cannot rely on the faith of your wife. H wife, you cannot rely on the faith of your husband. Children cannot rely on the faith of their parents. Parents cannot rely on the faith of their children. You know, it's, it, that's interesting. One of the, the trends that we sometimes see is parents who are living a very worldly life will put their children in Christian school desiring that their children have Christian influence while they themselves are living every manner of worldliness. Interesting little dynamic there, wouldn't you think? That's not the way it's supposed to work. 
The way it's supposed to work is, of course, that the parents are raising up their children in the admonition of the Lord, in the instruction of the Lord. That's the way it's supposed to work. You can't, you can't put your kids in church and in school and think, well, the children's righteousness will be mine and I'll ride on it because I did a good thing. I put them in Christian school. No, every man and every woman must stand alone in our relationship to the Lord. It's ours. We have our own relationship. And it's important to recognize that because I think sometimes we feel like we can ride on the faith of those around us. I'm standing amongst people that are worshiping. Doesn't that sort of give me credit? No. God wants your heart. But, you know, my, my, my wife, my husband, you know, my spouse is, is really spiritual. Doesn't that give me some kind of credit? No. No, you've got to stand on your own. And there's that there's invitation for us to recognize that word, which is a strong word, but it's a good one because there's where real, authentic revival comes from. Every single heart on fire. That's what he's looking for. And he goes on, verse 19, if I should send a plague against that country, pour out my wrath and in, in blood on it, cut off man and beast from it, even though Noah or Daniel or Job were in its midst as I live, declares the Lord God, they could not deliver either their son or their daughter. They could only deliver themselves by their righteousness. For thus says the Lord God, how much more when I send my four severe judgments against Jerusalem, sword, famine, wild beast, plague, to cut off man and beast from it, which he did. Yet behold, survivors will be left in it, who will be brought out, both sons and daughters. Behold, they are going to come forth to you, and you will see their conduct and their actions. Then you will be comforted for the calamity which I have brought against Jerusalem for everything which I brought upon it. Then they will comfort you when you see their conduct and actions, for you will know that I have not done in vain whatever I did to it, declares the Lord God. In other words, you'll see it with your eyes. It was necessary. Chapter 15 is interesting, very short. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Now, son of man, how is the wood of the vine better than any wood of a branch which is among the trees of the forest? He's talking about grapevine. Is a grapevine wood any better than the wood of the forest? Can wood be taken from it to make anything? If you were to take grape vine wood. Can you make anything from it? Can you make furniture from grapevine wood? No, it's not of any account for that. Can you make even pegs with it? He goes on. Can men take a peg from it on which they can even hang any vessel? In other words, can you put a wall peg out of it? No, it's not even good for that. What is a grape wood vine good for? Nothing. Well, wait a minute. It is good for one thing grapes it's good for making grapes it's good for growing grapes wait a minute let's not forget that that's the whole purpose of a grapevine is to make grapes so here's where he's going with this so therefore if the grapevine doesn't make grapes then what's it good for answer nothing I mean that's what it's made for what's the point Israel was made for fruit fruit What is fruit in our lives? We are made for fruit. Jesus spoke of that. I am the vine, you are the branches. Any uh, vine that bears in me is going to bear much fruit. What is the fruit he's speaking of? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. The character of God, the holiness of God, the, the character of God's heart alive. See, if you love the Lord, you're going to see your life transformed to be like him in character. That's the fruit of God seen in our lives. That's the very point. So he says of them, what's the point of a grapevine? Should be grapes. If you can't get grapes out of it, you can't make furniture. You can't even make a peg to hang your pot on on the wall. It's not good for anything. And so therefore, there's the problem. And we're, you know, the same. God wants to see the purpose of our lives. The purpose, the meaning, the significance of our life is found in him. You want meaning in your life? 
It's found in him. You want purpose? It's found in him. You want significance? It's found in him. Everything is made, you know, with a purpose. You know, like, for example, pie cherries. What is the purpose of a pie cherry? You know, a pie cherry is not good for eating. It is sour and bitter. We, when I grew up, we used to have a pie cherry tree uh, right in the, in the middle of the yard. Actually, there was like six different cherry trees. And uh, all, the, all the cherries on the other trees would be eaten by the birds. But they did not like pie cherries. And so we had this huge tree of pie cherries. You know why birds don't eat pie cherries? They are sour and tart and bitter. No animal likes to eat them. So then what's the point of pie cherries if no animal likes to eat them? Pies. That's the whole purpose of pie cherries. Have you ever had a cherry pie? made from cherries, picked right off the tree, washed and pitted, and put right into a pie, and then you eat it as soon as it comes out of the oven and cools off, like, oh, that is to die for. That's it, cherry pie with vanilla ice cream. <laughs> with me here? That's, the, that's like a glorious gift of God. He, when he made pie cherries back in the Garden of Eden, he was knowing that one day, we would come around and value those like no animal or bird would ever value. There's a purpose of their making them. Okay, the point is the same with grapes. The purpose of grapes, of course, is that very same picture. We were made to produce the spiritual life. And when we live in that spiritual life, we are abundantly alive, the way God meant us to. All right, let's finish it. Verse four, and if it had been put into the fire for fuel, and the fire has consumed both of its ends, and its middle part has been charred? Is it then useful for anything? And once it's been burned, it's especially not useful for anything. Behold, while it is intact, it's not made into anything. How much less when the fire has consumed it, and it's charred? Can it still be made into anything? No. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, as the wood of the vine among the trees of the forest, which I have given to the fire for fuel, so I have given up the inhabitants of Jerusalem. There was no fruit. That's why there was a fire. I've set my face against them. Though they've come out of the fire, yet the fire will consume them. Then they will know that I am the Lord. When I set my face against them, thus I make the land desolate because they have acted unfaithfully, declares the Lord God. Now, Ezekiel 16. I want to give you a warning in advance. Ezekiel 16 is very graphic, and so this is an opportunity. I, I'm looking around. If there are any children in the room, it might be advisable uh, for them to step out because it is exceptionally graphic. Let me just read through it. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations. See, this is the point. Make known to her where this fell apart, where this fell off the tracks. Where did this go wrong? And he's going to show them and reveal to them actually how they did it. He's going to get right into their head. And he's going to show them where the thing derailed. Here it goes. You say thus, thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem. Now your origin and your birth are from the land of the Canaanite. Your father was an Amorite and your mother was a Hittite. Actually, that's just an insult. He's saying uh, your, your background isn't good. Now, as for your birth, on the day that you were born, your navel cord wasn't cut, nor were you washed with water for cleansing, and you were not rubbed with salt or even wrapped in cloths. No eye looked with pity on you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you. Rather... You were thrown out into the open field, for you were abhorred on the day you were born. So you get this picture. He's trying to show Israel's de despicable state. See, this is important because sometimes uh, a Jew may feel, you know, like, hey, God chose us because we were the best uh, in the world. God's going to say, uh, sorry, that's not even close. It's quite the opposite. When you were born, your, your father was a Hittite and your mother was an Amorite. And when you were born, they didn't even wrap you with clothes nor wash you 
the blood off you, nor even rub salt on you, which is what they did for end of, uh, antibacterial purposes. You were like a, a child born, and then as you were a baby, taken from the mother's womb, they just threw you out in the field. You were abhorred and rejected. You were like a baby thrown out in the field. Don't, don't, don't say that you're like this wonderful thing. No, I'll tell you what happened. You're like that. Then, verse 6, I passed by, and I saw you squirming in your blood. And I said to you there while you were in your blood, I said, live. I said to you while you are in your blood, live. I took hold of you, in other words. I washed you. I picked you up in the field. I washed off your blood, rubbed you with salt. I put swaddling clothes on you. Verse 7, I made you numerous like plants of the field. You grew up. You became tall. You reached the age of fine ornaments. Your breasts were formed. Your hair had grown, but you were naked and bare. I passed by you and saw you, and behold, you were at the time for love. So I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. This is a um, marriage proposal. I swore to you and entered into a covenant with you so that you became mine. I married you. So you get the picture? I saw you there in your blood. I took you and I washed you. I adorned you. You became, uh, uh, of the time of marriage, you became mine. Verse 9, I bathed you with water. I washed off your blood and anointed you with oil. I clothed you with embroidered cloth. I put sandals of porpoise skin on your feet. I wrapped you with fine linen. I covered you with silk. In my love for you, I adorned you. I poured out the finest. The silk, the porpoise skin, the, the ornaments, the fine things. Uh, verse 11, I adorned you with ornaments and bracelets on your hands, a necklace around your neck. I put a ring in your nose. That was good. I put earrings in your ears. I put a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your dress was of fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth, the finest, the best. You ate fine flour, semolina finest flour, honey and oil, so you were exceedingly beautiful, and you were advanced to royalty. Oh, isn't this a beautiful picture? You were nothing. You were thrown out into the field. I took you. Now look at you. You're adorned up to royalty. Then your fame went forth among the nations on account of your beauty. For it was perfect because of my splendor which I bestowed upon you, declares the Lord. Here it goes. But you trusted in your beauty. You played the harlot. You thought you were all that. You thought you were all hot. And you were so beautiful and so charming and so wonderful. And every guy saw you and just had to have you. So you played the harlot because of your fame. And you poured out your harlotries on every passerby who might be willing. And you took some of your fine clothes made for yourself high places of various colors and you played the harlot on them, which should never come about or happen. These fine clothes I gave you, you did harlotry things on those gifts I made. Then you took your beautiful jewels made of my gold and my silver, which I had given you, and you made for yourself male images and you had sex with them. Then you took your embroidered cloth and covered them and offered my oil and my incense before them. But I loved you. You are mine. I took you from nothing. And you did that. And then my bread, which I gave you, fine flour, oil and honey, which I fed you, you offered before them, you would offer before them for a soothing aroma. The idols. So it happened declares the Lord. Moreover, you took your sons and your daughters 
whom you had borne to me, and you sacrificed them to idols to be devoured. Were your harley trees so small a matter that you had to do this? You slaughtered my children, and you offered them up to idols by causing them to pass through the fire. And besides all of your abominations and your harlotries, trees, you didn't remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare and squirming in your blood. You didn't remember. See, this is so good for us. We need to remember. Remember the hopelessness of who we were and the condition of our soul when God found us and what he did for us and how he blessed us. Never forget, never forget. Then it came about, verse 23, after all this wickedness, woe, woe to you, declares the Lord, that you built yourself a shrine and you made yourself a high place in every square. You built yourself a high place at the top of every street and you made your beauty abominable and you spread your legs to every passerby to multiply your harlotry. Pretty graphic. He's speaking spiritually, of course. You played the harlot with the Egyptians, your neighbors that are lustful. You multiplied your harlotry and you made me angry. Behold now, I have stretched out my hand against you, diminished your rations, delivered you up to the desire of those who hate you, the daughters of the Philistines who are ashamed of your lewd conduct. The Philistines are ashamed because you're worse than they are. Moreover, you played the harlot with the Assyrians because you were not satisfied. You even played the harlot with them and still weren't satisfied. You multiplied your harlotry with the land of merchants, Chaldea, Babylon, and yet even with this you weren't saying, uh, satisfied. You were insatiable in your sexual appetite. How languishing is your heart, declares the Lord. While you do all of these things, the actions of a bold-faced harlot. Now, you've got to admit with me, this is one of the most straightforwardly, bodaciously, in-your-face chapters in the entire Bible. Would you agree with me? And you've got you know, you to read it with an understanding that he's trying to wake up Israel. There's a lot we can learn from it. The Scripture says that all of these things are given for our example, that we would not do as they did. So there's, it's kind of like, let's learn from that. Let's watch their disaster and learn from it. And that's the best thing that we could ever get out of the, this chapter is like, Lord, I don't want to have spiritual adultery in my life. He's using graphic words to betray it. But Lord, I do not want to have spiritual adultery in my life. Amen? And therefore, we understand sexuality touches the soul and is waking us up to understand it. Now, uh, it goes on and on this way. And to be honest with you, I, I, you can read it at home if you can bear it. It's very strong. I want us to go to the end, okay? Verse 59. Well, verse 58. You have borne the penalty of your lewdness and your abominations. The Lord declares, for thus the, uh, says the Lord God, I will do with you as you have done, you who have despised the oath by breaking the covenant. Now marriage is a covenant. And he's talking about the fact, remember, that this was his wife. We're talking about his wife. He calls Israel his wife. And by the way, are we called wife you know, in any sense, spiritually speaking? Yes, actually, it, it's true. Um, we are called a wife. We're called a bride. The bride of Jesus. The bride of Christ. The church is the bride. And he uses, even in an interesting thing, okay, this is, this is, don't get weird on me here, but in Ephesians 5, he uses sexuality in our, as a picture of our relationship to Jesus. Don't get weird, please. He's using it spiritually. In the sense, he says, as husband and wife are one body, so is the church and Jesus one body spiritually. But he uses the, the pleasure and the joy of sexuality to describe that relationship. Again, do not get weird with it, because they were very open in regards to their sexual discussion. 
which sometimes actually is pretty healthy because he, he brings the spiritual bearing to it. Now, with that backdrop, we got to go to verse 60 because he says, nevertheless. Now, read the entire chapter 16 and then you get to verse 60 where he says, nevertheless. That word nevertheless is huge. Nevertheless. In spite of all of this lewdness and all this spiritual adultery and every imaginable depiction he gave, he says, nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth. You're still mine. I will not disown you. I will still love you. And I will still take you back. I don't know about you, but my, the only word that comes to my mind, wow. Wow. You mean to tell me, after all of that, you're saying you're going to take them back? Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Wow. Then you will remember your ways, and you'll be ashamed when you see how much love he has. It breaks your heart. Both your older sister and your younger sister, I will give them to you as daughters, but not because of your covenant. Thus, I will establish my covenant with you, and you will know that I am the Lord, in order that you may remember and be ashamed, and never open your mouth anymore because of your humiliation. When I have forgiven you all that you have done, declares the Lord God, oh, that is forgiveness. That is forgiveness. And I don't know about you, but I think we need to see the forgiveness of the Lord fresh and anew. And to, it humbles us. It humbles us when we realize how much we have been forgiven. And that he still loves us in spite of all that we've done. Doesn't it make you just want to love the Lord all the more? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the outpouring of your kindness. Because we see it here in living color. As ugly as it is, it's right before us. All that sin. And yet you still take them back. And you still forgive. Oh God, it makes us love you. It makes us thank our God for a heart after us. God, we just stand in awe of how your forgiveness is everlasting. Your kindness is everlasting. Your love knows no limits. Your grace knows no bounds and how you have won us to yourself. You have loved us with an everlasting love. We deserve none of it, but your love never fails. God, it just makes us want to respond by loving you back. It makes us respond by honoring you and worshiping you and giving you our heart in adoration. And thanks for all that you've done. We love you truly. Truly love you for how you have loved us. In Jesus' name, and everyone said,